So uh, I'm going to give you a presentation today, this morning, while you're wide awake, on data, <laughs> right? Uh, but we're, it's something that uh, we have a lot of, and it keeps growing at Johns Consulting. And so uh, we've gotten to a point where we've brought in people to look at that data to help us go through it, and uh, not just interpret the results, but uh, provide correlations with the result to make sure that it's valid what we're telling you. All right, and so we've got some slides for that as well. There's a lady in the, uh, uh, that I think used to work for Batesville. Her name is Rose Milto. If anybody's ever, if they know Rose, she did a large analysis on our performance tracker data. So that's what we're going to talk about. So today I'll talk about th this morning the trends and insights at Johns Consulting through our performance tracker software. And uh, I'm going to give you a little background on what is the performance tracker. Uh, what data did we look at, and then, of course, what those results were uh, that we received. So the performance tracker is a, a brainchild of, of ours, mine, back in 2006 uh, to provide surveys, actually, for our own funeral homes. Uh, just come from Paul Mortuary, we had a big survey thing. It was a very big part of our uh, incentive compensation plan and just a performance basis across a lot of rangers that we had. And so it was a mail merge thing that we had done, and uh, it was just a funeral home at need survey. And uh, as that grew, we, we uh, start, I thought the next best thing, so it wouldn't cost me too much money, is use a Microsoft Access database. And we did that, and that lasted about six months, and then it got too big. And so I hired uh, a friend of mine from college, and we found some India developers, and we started developing this performance tracker software. Uh, that we have today. And so it has expanded to where we do funeral home at need, uh, bilingual as well, funeral home pre-need surveying, cemetery at need, cemetery pre-need. We have a funeral home cemetery combo survey. And then uh, what was uh, asked for by Force Lawn, who's one of our larger clients within that system, uh, to have a discount letter campaign for their cemeteries so they could do uh, lead generation. And so we do that as well. So. It's got a cover page that goes with the survey. It uh, uh, just uh, explains the value of uh, understanding their feedback. And then the survey is two pages on the funeral home at need. And it was with uh, a lot of analysis by our team on how we ask the questions, what part of the experience do we want. And then to uh, Glenn's comments that he made yesterday, uh, those of you that are on it know that we've got uh, positive survey result uh, alerts. And those are very powerful for like giving those, at, you know, pats on the back. But we do want to know what those negative comments are and what are the things we can do to improve. So we talk about the initial experience, the arrangement itself, uh, facilities and vehicles. We've got to ask about that. How was the service? We ask a value question. And, uh, and then we have marketing questions as well as uh, giving them a chance to write down their feedback and ask if they want follow-up. So it's also a lead generating tool. And it's, it's grown to a point where I think Chad, Chad mentioned his name. Chad uh, looks over the software along with three data entry clerks. And uh, we have Rose Milto doing the analysis on an annual basis now. And there's, there's a lot involved. And there's uh, five developers, two software, uh, um, uh, custom software engineers. So it's a big deal now. So. <clears throat> The family then can respond via paper, or pre posted paid envelope, or they can fill their survey out online. Interesting statistic uh, out of the return rate, which is about 35%, something like that, only about 10% of them will fill it out online, which is kind of interesting to me. You know, again, talking about, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the customer themselves uh, and what they're more comfortable with, or, or uh, I don't know. You, you decide. We're, you know, I'm sure it will increase, and so that we put that in there to capture those results. The system then sends out, uh, of course, we want to know if there's a negative score or, or if there's an issue within the software or, or within the, the results. So sends out an email uh, to whoever is set up uh, on that system, or if there's a sales lead opportunity, or if there's a perfect score, or a uh, uh, personal story. And uh, for those of you that are on this, if you're not seeing these emails or you're not set up with that, then you talk to Chad and we get you set up. Um, these features roll out, and then sometimes we look back and notice, oh, that person didn't get on it. So, But an interesting result of this is, of course, we're always looking for how can we be better with the negative scoring. But the perfect score alert has been a really cool thing. 
and I, I can speak on behalf of myself, with, at Menke Funeral Home, I'm not there every day. And when the, there are perfect scores, it's a great opportunity for me to stop, shoot them an email, call them, and say, hey, I saw that, what a you know, great job. And uh, you know, it's, uh, those of you that are on it, I mean, some of you, that's what you enjoy more than the rest. So. The program, we have built in a dashboard up front to, again, trying to keep on key metrics at a high level for our customers, less uh, data to review. Has a survey dashboard where you can look at the key metrics on the survey results. Same with the sales side. And then one interesting uh, byproduct of it as well is we already had the address data. So we uh, integrated a mapping program and actually you can drill into your market and it will show you exactly where your cremations were coming from, where your burials were coming from, all that kind of stuff. So the pin map thing was a cool after effect of the whole thing. Um, so now as we get into what we knew was eventually coming, which was uh, the analysis of all this data to interpret it back for our customers and, and uh, not only individually but customer-wide, we were going to have to figure out how to take all the different ways they wanted to track cases and put it and roll it into something that statistically as it got higher it became you know we combined them but uh, then the you know then the statistical analysis varies but anyway the custom case types one thing I wanted to make sure in the system is that anybody could put whatever case type they wanted and so we did that but uh, a lot of them uh, res a lot of the customers reside within the standard case type levels and then it rolls up and it rolls up and it rolls up and the only purpose I'm showing you for this is that some of the analysis we did the only way to make sure we could provide an apples to apples is we had to roll it all the way up to like a primary case type level, which is burial and cremation, ship out and other, or something like that. So very high level. Um, because of the massive amount of data that comes in, uh, we have a data entry screen. We've hardly ever used it. We have uh, importing of data that comes in through various ways through our customers, and then uh, uh, just some uh, uh, statistics on it. The return rate's been about 35 to 45 percent. Surveys are sent out about two to three weeks uh, after we receive the data. Uh, we're sending out laminated surveys, sample scripts. There's a kickoff value presentation. These are for the clients that want that, us to handle that for them. And then uh, things are only as good as uh, people using them. And so anything in life. So. We uh, follow up after 90 days and offer the, uh, you, know, you the opportunity to, for us to review the data and give you our assessment of how to use it. And then you can export that data as well. So if you're currently a customer on it and any of these seem new to you, then you can talk to Chad or anybody at Johnson Consulting and you know, we would uh, go into detail more with that. So it's, uh, the program is kind of all inclusive. I didn't want this thing that says, oh, you want that? Well, then you get then you got to pay this or whatever. So it's, uh, it's printing and postage, personalized information, so it looks like it's coming from the funeral home and not John's consulting. Uh, Pre-postage paid envelope, filling it out online, the automated alerts, the survey reports, the sales reports, uh, the uh, presentation materials to the uh, funeral ranger, and then uh, we have uh, this customer satisfaction award, which you'll see uh, the result of that for some of the customers that are here. And when we built the system, the other th thing was, as, we, as I had hoped it would grow. I had a BHAG, I'll explain what that one is later on. Uh, and that was that this system would be so big that uh, w the next thing, so that people wouldn't call excuses as to why it didn't apply to them, is I would make sure we would identify them in certain markets and certain parts of the US and, and certain call volume sizes. And so the system also uh, uh, separates all of our customers by those various criteria. And so I'll show you how that works. And so that's why Customer Satisfaction Awards, there's uh, quite, quite a few divisions and classifications uh, for people to win those. And the reason is it, it will be interesting. I'll show you the reasons. Um, but it, it has to do with the unfair advantage that small funeral homes have in serving their customers. <laughs> but it's an interesting study to say if that's the reason, then why is, is there, can we create a BHAG? I'm not going to tell you what BHAG means unless you know what it means that says we can create that same personal experience within a large organization, you know? And so uh, that'll be a challenge. So trends and insights, uh, we were looking, so this r report was based on 2014 and 15 data. We're now in the process uh, starting next week and reviewing the 2016 data. So we'll have that going forward and it continues to grow. So the comparison of the family satisfaction and the comparison of the sales in those numbers. So. What we did is, 
uh, what that amounted to is 145,000 uh, sales contracts, or 145,000 uh, data points. Uh, not all of them had sales. Some of our customers, we only do surveys, uh, uh, but, but more sales contract information than survey, because we, for any of our accounting clients, will bring that data in whether they want surveys or not. So it allows us to increase the analysis on the sales side. And then, um, it was interesting to me, because it, it seems like in listening yesterday that a good sample for finding out uh, metrics or uh, customer wants and needs was like a thousand. You know, I was hearing a thousand, you know, I, I, I interviewed a thousand people or interviewed whatever. Well, we have 46,000 results. So there's a lot of data in here, all right? And uh, so that's what I'm going to get into to show you here. So data slides, and I, I won't, uh, I'll leave some up let you kind of stare at it. One thing I'll tell you is that everything I'm showing you is in a 40-page report that we have that I would offer to anybody that wants it. All you got to do is uh, email Jeff or Chad or myself. We'll send you that report that was done. It's very comprehensive. So as we went through the data, the first thing we looked at is the different case types chosen. And you should know that uh, dealing with 145,000 records and then uh, 45,000 on top of that for survey results, there's a lot you, if you've ever done data management at those levels, which is actually not a lot compared to other industries, you really have to go through it and say, okay, where are the ones where it was a $60,000 case that doesn't count? Because there were, there were some in there, like 50,000, I think. And then there were a lot that were like 200, 300, and it was like in a, it was more merchandise related, there was no service. So we had parameters to scrape that stuff. So uh, the data is very clean, as I guess my point of a statistician was in here, he'd be wanting to know that answer. And so anyway, just to make that note. So in doing that, these were the, the notes we saw as far as uh, 2014 is this blue bar. And in 2015 is the lighter colored bar. And it was, this was a slide just to see what were the selection preferences were and if they changed from year to year. And so it had the very obvious result that came that cremation had rose, I think the next slide will say it, about 1.8% and burial dropped about the same. Uh, ironically, again, there's nothing built in here to kind of make that happen. It, it, it literally happened that way. And so it, it just showing again that uh, inclination to go towards cremation. There, there'll be another slide in here I'll show you, which I think I heard yesterday, and that I think, Jim, maybe you mentioned it, but we are seeing more people, at least in these results, selecting cremation with a memorial service or something. It's not all these directs all the time. Maybe you mentioned that, but uh, it was a, um, whether we felt like maybe, I don't know if it's whether the direct disposition people are getting those directs and we're doing the good stuff or something, or, or we're doing a better job of converting. But we are seeing cremation memorial service uh, rising. So, um, so just the result of that, the 1.8%, about the same consumers uh, that didn't choose burial chose cremation. And so not a fact that we're not unfamiliar with. So these were the average sales by uh, case type within the system. Uh, we looked at burial graveside at need, uh, uh, burial immediate, burial pre-need, burial traditional at need, cremation uh, direct, uh, cremation pre-need, cremation traditional. I mean, we we kind of we tried to get as much detail until it started becoming where we had too much variance with customer data, and so some of the key areas were uh, the in, the average sale from uh, burial pre-need, the variance from burial pre-need to burial at need, and uh, it was, I've got the exact dollar amount, but it's obviously higher than the pre-need. I know a lot of us, uh, I look at your, you know, when I do valuations or financial analysis, and I see those pre-need discounts, and so it's not a surprise to me to see this kind of stuff. And then uh, the interesting thing was that the cremation pre-need average, and these are turned at need when I talk about pre-need, uh, was higher than uh, the cremation direct, and I'm going to guess probably in the pre-need. There was other things besides just directs in those pre-needs, but it talks about, uh, uh, to me, if I was, uh, I, I would want to be making sure if I had high cremation market that I was doing pre-need, because it sounds like if I can get a pre-need on them, I'm probably going to get a better average sale. At least that's what this told me when I looked at this data. So average per case dollar sales for pre-need burials declined 2% which seemed to be replaced by the nearly 2% increase in pre-need cremation sales. Uh, pre-need burial sales uh, generate 1,300 uh, per case less than the at-need uh, burial. 
and uh, the average pre-cremation sales per case were $692 higher than direct cremation. So that's a significant number. When I get down to, uh, I, I'm going to always do my uh, presentation that Al calls the doom and gloom presentation, but talk about average and its impact on the value of your business. And $692 average difference is a huge difference uh, for lots of things, and certainly value someday on your most valuable asset. So at need cremation memorials are showing significant growth in one year's time. So those were the sales numbers that we looked at. And uh, um, anybody have comments to any of that that you saw? Anything that was shocking and kind of strange? So the question is, is that training with the pre-need salespeople? Is that uh, growth? Is it both? Is it, uh, you know, what? And keeping in mind for a second, uh, this is burial traditional at need. This is pre-need burial. This could be traditional at need. It could be have immediate pre-needs in there. It could have great size. So there's some, you know, there's some variables in there. Uh, but typically, it's, it's not an unusual thing that I see where the pre-need burial, pre turned at need burial average is less. Uh, the thing that was interesting to me was, was this one, where the overall, you know, the cremation pre-need overall average was higher. Now, again, it's probably including these. So... Yeah, take it for what it is. So overall average sale within the data we have was 5151 in 2014, and then 5051 in, uh, in 2015. Uh, and then what we want to do is uh, look at that. Now we're going to like these primary case levels. We're kind of trying to roll it up and, and see what it is at the high level. And so overall, if you had all the burial together, you got a 7715 dropped a little, and then uh, the cremation stayed steady or actually grew. So, you know, we all get it. We know we're gonna, we need to uh, work on those creamy cremation customers, and we are. I almost said one thing. I don't know if you guys know, there's a guy by the name of Shelby Parrott, and Bob knows him, David knows him. And uh, so those of you who know Shelby, he was an old time, like Kentucky, uh, like Areas of Kentucky, you don't go unless you're from there. You know, Hazard, Kentucky, I didn't know that was a real place. I thought that's where the Dukes of Hazard was. And uh, I said, well, well, how do you guys, you know, how's cremation down there? He's like, cremation? He said, we, that usually only happens when there's a house fire. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we usually call it cremation. We don't even know how to say it. <laughs> Shelby Parrott. Uh-huh. So... Then we were able, to, again, because we filter this data and we offer all these uh, uh, ways to slice and dice it, we're able to look at what is the difference, is there a difference from average sale from call volumes of less than 150 calls, call volumes of 151 to 300, and then above 300. And it's interesting to me that, and you'll see this even with the customer service data, you know, the averages uh, drop. And I'm going to guess as the markets get bigger, the competition gets more and the average sale drops. You know, it's probably, it's not that way probably in every market, but it seems to be pretty consistent, at least within our data. And uh, so after you're done with all this, the, I think the, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a call volume firm of less than 150 calls in the Northeast with <laughs> or something like that. You'll see all these, it's un unbelievable. So there's your average sale by call volumes. And uh, then this was the average sale by marketplace, which you found interesting. So less than 50,000 people. You got these averages, 5,800 in 2015. Uh, marketplace of uh, 50 to 250,000, 47.99. 250,000 to a million, 4,900. And, uh, and greater than a million people, 4,600. And, you know, <laughs> it didn't matter which market it was, they all dropped. You know, I think we're all kind of going through that. But again, it is interesting, um, uh, the dynamics in just the smaller marketplace, the more, I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear your, your guys' comment as you look at this stuff. Um, looking at all the case types combined, we know what the av overall average was. Uh, this will likely result in the increase in families who choose less costly cremation over burials, of course, um, or cremation over burial. And then burial sales, burial sales were declining at a slower rate. This was interesting. Burial sales were declining, declining at a slower rate than the change of those uh, selecting burials, indicating those who chose burial or purchasing more expensive product services at funeral homes 
have raised prices somewhat to offset the revenue drop. You follow what I'm saying? All right. Um, so there's the decline in burials, but the, the, the sale, the correlation with the sale, this is statistician stuff, uh, wasn't the same. So we're, you know, we're trying to maintain that average even though you know, it's dropping. So, um, so the uh, combination funeral home cemetery, average sale, direct cremation, average sale. Uh, so direct cremation meaning a direct cremation business. And then standalone funeral home, and then funeral, ho funeral home with a crematory, not a combo, funeral home with a crematory. And uh, uh, seemed to be a good idea to be a funeral home, standalone. As I looked at these averages, uh, the combination funeral home and cemetery is, is peculiar to me that the average would be less. Again, it's the data we're collecting from our clients, but there are some significant size combos within this data. So I'm not sure what to make of that, to be too, quite honest. I mean, this is our first year doing this, and so this next analysis, we're going to do more correlations, dig in even deeper with this data. So. This was another one. This is why I wanted to move to the Northeast and open a funeral home. Because uh, I was trying to figure out, was there, am I in the Southwest? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, we are. So these were the various averages within the funeral homes in all the regions. So if you're thinking about starting a funeral home, you could take the slide and build your uh, business model to that. So North Central, uh, Northeast, uh, Northwest, uh, and then, you know, the, the averages, it's amazing. And what's, what's always fascinating to me uh, with all the data that I've looked at is that it, you know, the average sale, which you would assume then that uh, you can handle less cases, create more revenue, which means less stress on your staff. And then the assumption would be that they, something must be in there causing that average sale to be higher because the cost must be higher. And well, depending on where you're at, it's not. You know, and so it, it like blows me away. I, you know, I can move to like uh, Tennessee or Kentucky or some of these areas where the real estate's a little less, or Kansas maybe, you know, and get a better average sale, work a little less harder. And, you know, that's one of those things, work hard, and, but work smart. <laughs> or you can be in the Southwest with some of the rest of us from the Southwest, you know. High real estate values, high cremation, mobile, yeah, a lot of fun. So combination funeral homes and cemetery firm showing significant average sale per case sales growth, uh, whereas combination funeral home crematory direct cremation firms showed a decline in 2014. Standalone funeral homes had the highest average sale. So that was just the result of that. So as call, some of our observations then, as call volume increased per case sale decreased, especially among the larger, largest firms, which suggests that low price may be driving volume, perhaps. I mean, these are some assumptions we're, we're coming up with. On average, firms in smaller markets, less than 50,000, have higher per case sales than larger markets, possibly as a result of less competition. Uh, they also earn o higher overall satisfaction ratings than larger firms, which might be a function of the personal relationship with the owner's staff. Uh, enjoys with the families in the smaller market, reserving and better service provided. So the, um, you know, what is it, 80% of the funeral homes out there are 110 calls or less, whatever, whether well, that means they're all in small markets. But, you know, I, I, you know I, the good news is in those markets, they certainly see, you know, good value to it, and they, there's a personal touch with the owner. And uh, what this tells me as a funeral home owner is how can I, how can I try to create that same experience? And, in a larger market, in a larger volume, you know. So I don't have the answer. That's for us to figure out together, right? So product sales. These are the averages of all the product sales that we saw. We looked at service fee, casket, outer barrel, container, urn, uh, alternative container, memorial products, cemetery, monument, flowers, discounts. So 2014-15, uh, when I look, uh, service fee about uh, more or less the same. You know, there's some increase in there. Memorial products was a little down. Uh, <clears throat> discounts increasing. So that slide, does that uh, say anything to anybody? What's your service fee average? Does it look like something like that or a little less? Or does that look about right? You know, there's a lot of data in here to, to come up with these results. Um, service fees generated the higher, uh, highest per case sales uh, both years with an average of 3,500. Uh, 3552 would be exact in 2015, followed by caskets averaging 2290, and both remained relatively unchanged. Sales per case increased on average 
uh, $34 for monuments, $13 for flowers, $18 for outer barrier containers, all other per case pro uh, product sales decrease, actually. So again, there's a lot of data in here. So if you think this stuff's wrong, then I don't know where you're gonna find more to compare. I mean, so these are the results that we saw. So overall satisfaction, this is the survey side. And uh, we looked at it from all the different uh, burial types, or I'm sorry, burial and cremation types, case types. Graveside, immediate, burial pre-need, uh, traditional. And so uh, the interesting thing was the cremation pre-need, so I was just telling you that you know, the average sale seems to be higher in the pre-need, and it's obviously got a mix of other than at need direct in there. But the cremation pre-need uh, customer satisfaction levels were less than any of the others. I don't, I'm trying to figure out why that would be. This is a lot of data that says that's right. I'm just not sure why that is. So a cremation pre-need, a cremation pre-need, when uh, we service that on an at-need basis, the customer satisfaction level was lower. And uh, um, certainly is, uh, um, when these people are coming in, we're meeting with them, uh, uh, my God, I mean, if they're choosing cremation, they don't like that. I, I don't know if we would actually just share this slide and say you need to use burial or something. <laughs> but, you know, I thought it was interesting. And then cremation with memorial was the highest. So that's interesting, too. So if, they, if, you, if you sold them on the value of service with a cremation and they chose it and we surveyed them, they would probably have the highest satisfaction of any of your case types. I found that very interesting. So if you're ever worried about upselling people, the, the fact is, they seem to be pretty satisfied when they have a memorial service with their cremation. I thought that very interesting. All right, that's an important slide to me. So overall satisfaction by call volume. Uh, less than 150 calls, uh, you know, uh, it was actually the same in 2014. I don't have, the, there it is, 2014, but grew in 2015 that if it's less than 150 calls, the people seem to be more satisfied and the 151 to 300. Uh, was kind of the, it was a little better and then, or I'm sorry, a little worse, I guess I'll use it that way, and then it declined a little less than that uh, for the over 300. So again, I think it just speaks to the personal service uh, afforded when you're smaller and uh, the problems that we all go through, no matter if you're Johnson Consulting or Maggiano's or whatever, as you grow, how do you can maintain that culture and that level of service and and it goes to what like uh, um, Chris was talking about, about setting these standards as, you, as these people come on and living it. And, and the book, uh, it's an audio book that I've been listening to, Scaling Up, on this morning on the way here, you know, he said, look, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna take all this and you're just gonna create banners and then hand out laminated things, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actually living it, you know? So it, it can make a difference and everybody's trying to get to where it feels personal like that, but that they can still be big and enjoy the, the profits and, and revenues from being a bigger firm. Combination funeral homes and cemeteries, these were uh, the survey results by the different types. And I love this. Um, it's disappointing, again, because I lo sure love the families to, to see this. So this is a direct disposition, this is a direct cremation business only, this right here. The survey results, which I have not made up, this is out of 45,000 results, uh, say that uh, short of comparing it to a combination funeral home cemetery, and I've worked, if, you've, if you guys own those, there's so much dynamic, there's so many things that can go wrong <laughs> within a, a funeral home cemetery combo, not, not because it's a bad place, but you just, you, you at the funeral home, you're done, you have them for a couple of days, and then they go to the cemetery, and if there was a problem, now you've inherited that problem for the rest of your life, you know, and so, um, I could see how it'd be some challenges at combos to, to uh, because there's just more variables to keep the customer happy. But seeing the direct cremation places, it was surprising to me in a way, because I thought for sure if people wanted direct cremation, that's where they went. They didn't want to pay anything extra that they'd have. They'd certainly be very satisfied with that. And this is saying that the standalone funeral home is providing a better, better customer experience than the direct cremation businesses in these results. Again, a lot of results. We're not talking about 1,000 or 1,500 out of 45,000. That's what it's saying. Anybody have a comment to that one? Is that surprising to you? Uh, again, we know that you know, when you're providing a, a service and they're seeing all that, that, uh, that 
that service side where you're helping them through the more com complex uh, items of a, a funeral rather than just a direct cremation. They obviously respond with uh, um, uh, being very appreciative. There's not much to respond to when you're just getting a you know, turn and burn type thing. So maybe that's the reason. I don't know. <clears throat> I'll speak in my experience working at, uh, at Palm and managing all their cemeteries and working at their largest and working with their smallest. And again, I do the arrangement and then I go out in the cemetery and there was just, there was more to make a mis there was just more things to make a mistake on really. And so I think that's a little bit of it uh, because uh, Palm Eastern, uh, you know, I, they might have thought we were a corporate owned place. It was so, so giant. But then we had smaller places and it was really, um, I don't know, I felt like I had good customer satisfaction, but I was always, when I was doing a funeral at, with going out to the cemetery, there's just a lot more to it. Plus, depending on if you're the one doing the arrangement and if you're giving it to the cemetery, like a cemetery counselor to, to meet with them while you're doing this and then they come back, it's, I could, at least I, in my experiences, I could see how you could, you're putting more variables to mess up, but it might say that, um, it would be interesting to see, to your point, if uh, I could look at maybe the smaller cemetery, but more so the cemeteries where the arranger did everything. He took the family out and selected the cemetery and came back in. It's a long process, too. You, you, you just kind of wonder where they just start burning out with that kind of stuff. But um, I really, I, uh, again, was fascinated with the direct cremation part of it. And uh, it sure feels good. Um, do you guys know Todd Van Beck? You guys heard that name? Todd sent me a letter after we issued this report out in the trade pubs, and he's a professor at Gupton College, and uh, he used, I think it was one of these slides where he was just showing these arrangers, uh, all of which we hope they're training well because we need more, you know, you know, we need staff, good staff at our funeral homes, just using this as an example to tell them that, look, you just, you know, there is a lot of value in what we do. Uh, if you do it right, you know, don't, don't worry about what these direct cremation guys are. These people aren't, ha they aren't happy in general with the world, so, <laughs> you know, focus on the ones that are, you know, so. Uh, overall satisfaction by market size it was no surprise, less than 50,000 again. Uh, marketplace 50 to 250, and so it just kind of uh, was on that slide again um, as you went into markets, although um, over a million for what have you, whatever reason, it was kind of the same as, I don't know, it's 250 to a million was a little less. But again, lesser market size, better satisfaction. And then, uh, then looking at this slide, uh, what I, I've also come up with, if you see all these slides, if you're in the Northwest, that's, they seem to have lower average sale, lower satisfaction. I think I, I just move, don't move to Southwest though, because it won't be much better for you. So, but, <laughs> no, but, uh, Northeast, look at that. I mean, and these were some of the highest averages, South Central. So it's an interesting correlation of uh, satisfaction and perception of value and the average that uh, it doesn't seem to be related to the fact that they saved money. You know, it's that they, that they saw the value and the things that you did, that you solved their problem. As t I think Todd even, Todd Van Beggen told me, you know, that he's, he always asks, you know, what is your job as a ranger? And it's to solve the problem that the family has. And so... Sounds like when there's not much of a problem to solve and you're just cremating, you know, they don't, they haven't seen really what you've done. What did we say yesterday? That they're, they just think that every cremation is the same and that it costs this and you're just going to burn them. And what's your, what's, your, what's your purpose in this equation outside of being the guy licensed to have to handle it? And I think uh, when they're getting the full service, they're obviously seeing very much how much value you have. So it's a very interesting thing. I think it, it's a good pep rally talk. But it's also to figure out how you can create that same experience no matter what choice they're choosing. I don't know. In 2015, satisfaction was highest among families choosing at-need cremation with memorial, uh, at-need graveside burial, which is interesting, and then traditional burial. Despite the rise of families opting for cremation, pre-need cremations were rated lowest in satisfaction. Uh, pre-need turn at-need cremations were rated lowest in satisfaction, and at-need direct cremations were next lowest. Uh, certainly illustrated the per importance of funeral directors to understand each family's reasons for choosing cremation and meet those uh, needs to increase satisfaction. Kind of like the guy on the phone yesterday, uh, you know, and then you just moved him on to, you know, a place that costs less, you know. That's a value culture problem we, I, they needed to fix, that's for sure. So funeral homes serving primarily whites and Hispanics earned the highest overall satisfaction scores. 
those serving primarily Asians were rated lowest for every reason. We had, we had this data, so I'm just throwing it up there, indicating an underserved ethnic group, at least within our data set. Among funeral home types, standalone funeral homes earned the highest overall average satisfaction for both years, and combination funeral home cemeteries were lowest in this data. So uh, anything stand out? Anything change your mind about? Again, I go back to uh, the small market size experience, the smaller funeral home, the more personal touch, uh, the value that we're seeing that uh, people that choose service are getting when, when they're uh, explained the option or, and or uh, switched over to make that choice. Uh, and uh, it's disappointing to see that, uh, um, that not only are they, if they want to use just a direct cremation, they're doing that, and then they're not really satisfied with it. It's, uh, man, what an opportunity. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer how to solve it, you know, but what an opportunity if we can, you know, really. And certainly, it's, it goes back to trying to get them to understand the value of memorialization. That's you know, likelihood to recommend. So we have a question within our survey called the Net Promoter Score. Um, it's just one way to keep all of our data in check to find out, uh, at the end of the day, to Glenn, Glenn's point, you know, they'll say they're satisfied, but what does that mean? You know, are they, so the big thing we want to know is uh, how, you know, at, at what satisfaction level were they where they would actually be a raving fan? You hear about that, there's a book about it, and, and uh, tell somebody else. And so we have our, our uh, likelihood, likelihood to recommend thing, the net promoter score is zero out of 10. And uh, these were just some of the, result, uh, the responses that we got when we asked them about uh, the likelihood to recommend that I thought were worth putting up here. One was saying uh, you know, they were, it was a low score to, to recommend because they, there was unexpected costs. Uh, there were costs were not explained clearly. These were the top responses that we saw. Attempts to sell them items they did not need. A ashes, not available when promised. How common is that one, my God, I think. <laughs> it just, here the whole time. And then errors and problems with the obituary and death certificate. These are, it's so funny how it's always the same thing, you know? And so, you know, what's the training going on for that? And um, uh, you know, everything in life, I, I've come to the conclusion because I, you know, I have a software company, I have Johns Consulting, I got a funeral home, and I've been in business ventures with other people. And it always seems like the same, the problem that's caused by any of those is communication. It always comes down to communication, no matter what it is. It's a communication problem. And so a lot of these are communication problems. You know, they're real, I, all these would be. So I think that's a big one on uh, the staff training and, and continual improvement and, and the culture at the funeral home. So while most respondents were very, were, are very likely to recommend a funeral home, they're less likely to do so in 2015 with our data, probably mostly due to the lack of miscommunication regarding costs, unwanted sales attempts, and performance issues. Uh, likelihood to recommend was down uh, uh, from its 2014 averages from every case type and across all market segments because of widespread decline in, in reasons com consumers cited. Uh, so because of the widespread decline in reasons consumers cited for the rating, funeral homes may be trying to make up for the decreased revenues with incremental costs or, or increased costs without notice unappreciated sales attempts, and lower quality service levels. So again, uh, you know, as we work to, work to figure out how to stabilize revenues, God forbid, grow them, you know, that we're careful about how we go about that, right? You know, we know that uh, uh, providing a memorial service for cremation offers a, a great customer satisfaction, but there are probably very bad ways to convey that message, you know? You need to do this, that's stupid, and whatever your, your the reasons are, but... You know, it's, it's that script that each one of us has our own way of telling it. And some arrangers, you'll cringe when you hear how they do it, and some, it, you know, it's like it just comes right. They, they're so bought into understanding that. And so I think, again, all these slides, I'm, we're gonna, we can email you this report, just ask for it, and uh, it's probably something valuable to share with your arrangers. You know, some of the things I'm talking about right now, it certainly was for Todd Van Beck in training the funeral rangers he's going to send out to all of us. So I thought it was pretty cool. Satisfaction with uh, aspects of the funeral experience. So these are the different areas of funeral experience and then the satisfaction levels associated with them. And there are some very common themes that we see every year. So uh, 
these are scores out of a thousand. It is uh, it's a comprehensive scoring metrics that we metric that we do within the software. But the one that is always the lowest, and I, I, I'm like a broken record with this, is the initial contact. And uh, my uh, correlation to it is that somebody's coming to the funeral home that they probably have ever, never been to or is the first time, and, and how's that experience up to they meet somebody? And uh, because they're on edge, they, they don't, they don't want to be there. They don't really want what you got, but they have to be. And just to, how is that? It's the... It's the Pinnacle of like first impressions are everything, you know, because it's uh, um, if it's uh, I would imagine if that first impression is uh, perfected, I think the rest of the process, like anything else, is going to be great. You know, whether it's a presentation that I'm doing, or what, how is the first two minutes going to go, or three minutes, and how is it going to go for the funeral home experience? This is always the le least uh, satisfied uh, aspect of the experience. Just so you know, always. Even at your own funeral homes, check, check it out. It's probably the lowest. Uh, ranging director, facilities and vehicles, uh, I, I'm happy to see that the you know, staff and services was the highest part of it. I mean, that should be. Otherwise, we're, we're not doing what, what they came here to do. So um, I always point to the initial contact. Uh, consumers are most satisfied with the genuine care concern express, but least satisfied with their initial phone conversations, Mark. So there's, there was... The, more dig into that uh, initial point of contact. So express, uh, but least satisfied with the initial phone conversation and the welcome received. 45,000 people telling us this. So some commented their first contact with the funeral home was an important reason they chose the funeral home in the comments that we had. So this is a very critical thing. Um, we're doing it at, at Menke, and I would highly suggest all you, you know, Call it an annual thing or a quarterly thing or a, in your weekly huddles, just talking about the, the face of the funeral home as they walk in. Or, and the face of the funeral home can be on the phone or it can be on the internet or whatever. It's huge. It's interesting. They all are, are the, respond the same way. So um, for 2014 and 15, consumers rated their funeral directors highly across all attributes measured, but they earned the highest ratings on effectiveness in listening and answering questions and being attentive to the needs. So. That was good to see, good to hear, something to focus on, obviously. That's the communication part, because when that fails, everything else does. So, Satisfaction with vehicle's appearance and claiming this condition was rated highest, and convenience and comfort of the facilities received the lowest scores. So this was interesting. We just had this discussion about uh, what they say, due to outdated and poorly maintained appearance or a musty smell at the funeral home. So um, if we saw low scores, those were the reasons. So you know, don't let that be a reason. That, those are things that are... You know, you don't even have to, you know, it's easy to fix, you know. Families are most satisfied with the funeral home staff's friendly, accommodating manner, followed by the actual service and ceremony. And uh, those are just some of the things as it relates to that. So uh, throughout the funeral experience, again, recap, initial point of contact, communication, uh, how is it over the phone? You heard ta uh, Paul's yesterday and what that experience was like. Uh, so... A big deal at the funeral home. So cost of products and services, this is our value question, as we call it. And uh, you want them, you know, you can look at this a couple ways, right, Rick? <laughs> it, was it lower than expected? And that means you delivered so high that they, they felt like they just got a bargain for it. Um, or was it about as expected? I certainly, I don't know that we'd want it to be more than expected. So in general, most saw, thought it was about as expected, but, you know, to me, it would be interesting to drill more in. For those of you that are having this sur survey program done, you know, what are, why, are the lower than ex why are they saying lower than expected? Because we certainly don't want to be giving it away, but you know, is it because we're just delivering great service? Maybe that would be one. So most respondents say the cost is what they expect, and most cost expectations are unchanged. Uh, of note, our direct cremation firms are trending to lower than expected costs, and firms in the north central region are trending to higher cost perceptions. So of note, Direct cremation firms are trending to the lower than expected costs. Um, they're not there. They just had a trend, at least in this analysis we did. And then if you're in north central region, there was a trending to a higher cost perception for what it was worth, just within the data we saw. So reasons a funeral home was chosen. Uh, this one has some interesting uh, components to it, but we, we ask them, how did you find us? So previously served, prearranged, convenience, recommended, 
other reputation of the funeral home, initial phone call, church organization, hospice, price, advertising, website, yellow pages, hospital, you know, it goes on. So previously served is the big, was the big one. And I think convenient location or recommended usually was number two. The number two now is prearranged. I thought that was interesting. So out of all those respondents, and it's up, uh, they said that the reason they went to the funeral is because they had a prearrangement. Now, they, they could have said because they were previously served. They said because it was prearranged. It's kind of interesting. It tells you about the power of pre-need, I would say. So the uh, point is that on this, they can select previously served and prearranged, and they can do uh, multiple selections here, the highest being that they were previously served. And then the prearranged one was interesting to me. Um, a very telling thing on having an active pre program, and then uh, where your location was, and then somebody recommended you, and so then you go to the bottom, uh, uh, trying to figure out where you're spending your time, you know, the 80-20 rule, right? So uh, this seems like one over here on the left-hand side that would be a good, good uh, uh, area to focus on, and then your website and Yellow Pages advertising, these are important things to have, but it's not at the moment, it's growing, but it's not at the moment how they're, why they're choosing you, right? So uh, there's still a lot to be said about uh, that experience they had the last time they came in. So, survey respondents most commonly, cho commonly chose a funeral home because it previously served, although other reasons starting to trend up, especially prearrangements and having a convenient location. So uh, correlations and relationships, I'll, I'll show you this. Real quick, just so you, there's, you can show some tie-ins we were trying to find. So we looked at and uh, concluded that overall firms with higher satisfaction had higher sales, you know, and uh, vice versa. So as family satisfaction increased, so, so did uh, sales. So w another thing, again, uh, uh, for the arrangers to see just how important it is uh, with that experience and the communication with those families because in general, if the families are going to be ha happy, they're going to be happy to spend as well, right? Not, uh, shouldn't be uh, a total surprise, but it is interesting how we forget that point sometimes. So, And there's a, absolutely a correlation within this data. Uh, firms with higher likelihood to recommend ratings tend to have higher sales. Uh, firms with lower likelihood to recommend tend to have lower sales. So. Um, it just goes probably back to, the, again, this correlation of price and uh, would you tell somebody and how was the satisfaction, it all goes together, you know. And so as you figure out how can we maintain average or increase sales, it certainly sounds like to me you could almost have uh, that initiative over here focus on satisfaction and making sure they'd come back and this would just solve its problem, you know, you'd kind of solve the problem right here. And what a... What a better way to explain to arrangers too, because I, I don't, you know, I don't want to be in there meeting with families feeling like I got to be a salesperson. I will be in there feeling like I need to make sure they're happy and satisfied and whatever. And so, uh, what a great angle and, and comment to tell them. And I think that that was probably one of the comments Todd Van Beck had too. You know, that it wasn't this whole thing about you know being pushy salespeople. It's about providing customer, uh, providing customers with a presentation, make sure they understand the options and uh, felt like they were served instead of that we were just pushing paper and, and uh, really, you know, to uh, somebody's point about uh, this, the, the legal document where we're just sending it on and saying, sign here, you're done. You know, we know that those uh, people in general, because those were like the direct cremation type of people, they weren't real satisfied or they really didn't see the value you brought, that's for sure. So we know statistically the higher satisfaction translates into higher sales, so improving satisfaction is a win-win. Right. While cremations are rising, it's unclear families are aware of all the cremation service options. I think it's, it's actually pretty aware that they're not, they're not aware of all the options. Uh, cremations with memorials and traditional cremations have higher satisfaction and sales than direct cremations, yet direct cremations are the most common cremation disposition chosen, chosen and are trending up. So that yeah, makes you go like that. And then uh, it's important to be transparent with cost using clear and consistent language and communications, oral and written, ad and advertising, so families understand what they are receiving for the cost, and your firm builds upon its positive reputation. When a consumer makes their initial contact with the funeral home, we, that was one of the observations, right? 
Uh, that is the only chance you will have to make a positive first impression, make sure it's indeed positive. All right, so there's a lot of data in there, and it's going to, as the years go on at Johnson Consulting, we're going to get, we're going to dig into more some of these questions where I didn't have some of these slides, whether it's in Canada or, or some of these other correlations. And so uh, it's exciting to, to be able to share that with you guys and go through that. And we, uh, we're, we have lots of different skill sets, but bringing this Rose Milto in has been a big help, and it's just going to get better as it, as, the, as it goes on. So what I want to do is now show you know, just how all of this rolls up and, and as, uh, impacts one key metric for any funeral homeowner, and that's their value. It is their most valuable asset that they have, and I want to show you real quick how all this impacts value. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. All the following firms are 500 call firms. All right, and so the question is, which one has the most value? Uh, and these are some studies just out of our doing our business valuations, our M&A services that we provide, and this is the tie-in you're going to see with how average sale impacts that. And these are often slides, Karen, we were talking about it, slides that you would show your range or saying, look what you're doing, you know, look how you look at your positive impact and look at what happens when you don't have these average sales uh, or do these presentations correctly. So. Uh, in a business one, you got f the call volume is uh, kind of right around 500, 450, 510, 500, 495, 500. Business number two, hopefully we're not that one, 675, 650. It's still a 500 call firm though. And then business number three is growing and it's 500 this year. So what's interesting is, um, and this is just a study, so this is kind of something you would tag into your bucket of succession planning guidance. And that is to have good uh, call volume trends and what its impact is on value whenever you want to sell to your employees or sell to somebody else or transfer your, your kids. Um, in this case, typically we see that business one is the one that's going to have the most value. Um, it's, it would be disappointing to think this one isn't. But again, from a statistical standpoint, for anybody smart enough, uh, looking at this and uh, at these corporations or somebody does a lot of business acquisition development, um, you're just not sure whether they're still a 500 call firm yet, so you need another year. So you're usually more cautious. This is the one, and it's, it, the whole point is that you know, not, all not all those 500 call firms had the same value, all right? And so we'll get calls where people say, you know, I've got a 500 call firm. Um, here are my average sales is this. What is my firm worth? I mean, I just like cringe when I hear that because there's so many other variables to it. Uh, but the bottom line is have a good trend at your firm if you're planning on selling anytime soon or transferring or you, you want to get a loan, you know, you're going to have to get a valuation for that. Um, and be working on it now. Pre-need is a part of this. Don't be too late. So uh, that's one thing. So the other thing I'm going to do is run a scenario by you because it's just fun to do this. And here's where we kind of see the impacts on average sale. And so let's assume we've got a firm that's got a $4,500 average sale, it's 500 calls, we'll assume it's the one that's stable 500 calls. And so we'll have revenue of $2,250,000. Let's say uh, these are just some assumptions I have to play in here so I can prove my point here. The cost of merchandise is 22%. This uh, cash flow or EBITDA as we call it, the cash generated uh, for the firm is 30%. And so let's say it's 675,000 and let's use a six time multiplier for the moment. So let's say this 500 call firm is worth a little over $4 million, all right? You got all that? So let's talk about you uh, grow those calls more. So you've you got your initial point of contact down and you're, you know, the communication's going well and you're growing uh, 10 more calls and they're sustainable calls and they're at that 4,500. That's $45,000, the profit, we layer that cost in Assuming that we didn't need any more uh, staff to service that, you've just added 200000 in value to your business. All right? And this, I use this example because we don't look at our businesses that way, but it's real. And the, re the, the reason you're going to find out it's real, or you'll find out it's real when it's time for you to sell or transfer, and we tell you what the value is, and you're either very excited because you listened to this and, and you were doing some of this stuff, or I broke the news to you that... Well, on average, we see that you know, the call volume looks about 10 less, and so actually your value is probably about 200,000 less than I told you last time. <laughs> you know, so, and, uh, but let's not stop there. Let's say you lost 20 calls. Let's say you lost 30 calls. These are the value implications to your firm. 
uh, if these type of things happen. And so the good news is if we're growing the calls, we're, get, we're growing by that value. Again, with assumptions that you're not needing extra staff, what have you. Um, and uh, the big point is, you know, maintain that uh, call volume. It's a tough one for funeral homes. I mean, that's what we just hope to do if we can grow. But if you can grow, it has some very serious impacts to value. And certainly if it declines, you know, you really need to be keeping an eye on that. So let's talk about the average sale impact. And this is, this speaks to just segmenting out each uh, ranger and how they, add, they contribute to that value of your firm, uh, which is, uh, can be a little shocking. So let's say you, uh, you're getting them more to memorial cremations, they're satisfied, and you've increased your average sale by $100. Now, I think somewhere in there I was showing how the average sale increased by $690 on one of my slides or something. So I'm just going to use $100. Okay, so you're a 500 call firm, $100 increase in sales. Uh, your revenue grows 50000 The good news is you didn't have to buy anything extra. You just it all fell to the bottom line in your, in your revenues, right? And so 50,000, so you got, uh, um, it fell right to the bottom line, $100 more in average sale, 300 grand in value. If I can prove that as the consultant when I'm out there doing evaluation or marketing it, I've increased the value of that, that firm by 300 grand. And uh, it's real stuff, it, it, it's not made up, it's a fun thing we can do at John's Consulting because of the, the di all the different data points that we have including brokering and business valuations. So, but I don't want to stop there. I mean, uh, the fact is you could certainly lose that if you lose your average, you know, we saw that the average sale overall went from 5,100 to 5,000 or something like that. So that could possibly mean that within all those respondents, they each lost about 300,000 value at their firm, possibly. Um, or if you had a $150,000 uh, decrease or a 200,000 or an increase, you know, it's, I'll, I want to say it's up to you, you know. It's, it's not that it's an easy task and I don't have the answer. I mean, we're all trying to figure that out. We know that these cremation customers are coming in and uh, um, uh, we're thinking direct cremation because they're saying it and then they get it and they're not happy and the average is less. So who won out of that? Nobody, you know. So the, the result is this as well and um, it's just a, a fact for most of us in this room that have funeral businesses that's probably your most valuable asset that you own, you know, or that you're managing for somebody else. And so, uh, you know, this is something to really keep an eye on for sure. Um, how does the arranger pre-need counselor things, uh, a pre-need counselor af affect this? So, here you got two arrangers. One really gets it and they're uh, showing those families the value of memorial cremation and the other one's saying, well, they told me direct, so that's what I'm going to do. And they're both handling 150 calls. Let's say this is a 300 call firm for the moment. So we've got this combined revenue of the 720 to 630. And when you just layer in all the additional costs uh, and distribute it across both the rangers, one is bringing a million two, almost a million three in value, and the other one's contributing, you know, creating a value of a million 130 for you. And so. What's interesting is you could do a simple, nothing more than either train this one or move them out and get one that also gets it and does it here and add, what is it? You're adding you know, an extra 162,000 in value and you haven't done anything else except, as they say, find those A players, the people that get it, the people that should be meeting with those families and getting the others out. You know? And uh, again, this is something we don't always look at because I think your head would spin if you were looking at it every month, but it's something I would highly suggest you look at once a year or twice a year and uh, how those, each arranger is impacting your overall average sale because it is absolutely impacting the value of your business. You know? And that is the thing, that's our legacy, that's what we hope to retire off of and, and transfer to the next generation. That would be the most noble thing. So. Um, it's a big deal. Rangers looked over 2.4 million in value. How often are you looking at it considering its security? Just be like uh, having a, a, a portfolio of uh, investments. So big deal. So um, the one thing is, I was actually when I was trying to, f I, I changed the slides last night and uh, I was uh, looking for like a deer in a headlight and I couldn't find the right one or whatever. But usually after I finish this, everybody's looking at me and saying, I think that's, oh no, that might be right. Oh. Uh, yeah, so 
Anyway, this is the one I saw. So the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. All right, that's what that slide said. And uh, it is true, this stuff. And uh, the reason we can uh, have these type of discussions and presentations, we have a lot of data to support it. And so all of you wouldn't be here if you weren't trying to address these things, but they're real issues. They're real, they're real opportunities, actually. Let me say it that way. Because uh, uh, I, I think I just saw if you could increase. We saw that like uh, memorial cremations were 690 higher, and the customer service ranking was higher. And so I was only using average sale increases of 150 to 200 dollars. Imagine if you actually were getting all that. So it's significant. And uh, you know we get excited when you buy a stock and it goes from whatever, and you, you look at it, and you've made 40,000 dollars. I mean, that's nothing compared to what you can do in your own business. Nothing. You know, it's pretty cool.